Hello and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Susan Guthrie, your host, and today we have a special issue, especially for some of you listeners out there who are in a particular situation in your divorce. It's interesting because I spoke to this week's guest uh, a few weeks ago about this episode, and I think it was just a couple of days later that I received a direct message from a listener asking for this topic. So I know that you are out there. I know that this is something that you're struggling with, and I'm very much looking forward to speaking with my guest today. Her name is Cindy Gunraj. And we are going to be discussing the cultural issues that can put pressure, additional pressure on your divorce. And Cindy knows this because she's been through it herself. Um, I do not normally read someone's bio, but I thought Cindy did such a beautiful job explaining this tricky situation um, that I'm just going to read a little portion of her bio here before we get started. So peeling away the veils of cultural taboos, Cindy Gunraj bravely left a stifling marriage and deepened bonds with her parents. She's an ICF credited coach and certified divorce coach, helping women who are contemplating divorce and are deeply concerned about cultural pressures that come into play in divorce. She is, by the way, the author of the number one Amazon bestseller. For those of you who are watching the video, I'm holding it up. It's called Winning Your Parents' Approval for Divorce, Seven Practices to Leave Your Mess Marriage with Their Blessing, which I, I love that. And by the way, stick around to the end of the episode because Cindy is going to be giving away free e-copies of the book. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Something got caught in my throat. Just cut that part out, Darlene. So first, I just, Cindy, this is a topic that I have wanted to cover for a long time. I'm so happy that you reached out to me and that we're going to be able to talk about this. I thoroughly enjoyed your book and found a lot of enlightening information. One thing I want to point out to people, as a divorce attorney, I have worked with clients in this difficult situation um, where it's not just... um, you know, difficulty with the divorce process itself, but also because the family is so entwined and so much a part of the divorce process. So I know there's going to be a lot of help in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Susan. And I'm just grateful to be talking about being able to talk about this topic. Well, and I think that the fact that within days of you and I talking, I heard from a listener, and it was interesting because she had reached out to me on another topic, but very quickly as we discussed what was happening in her world, it became apparent and she pointed out that it really was because her husband's family was very involved and had views on the divorce her family and parents and an extended family actually had views on the divorce. And she actually, at the end of that conversation said, Hey, if you're ever looking for a good topic, do this. And I said, as a matter of fact, it's coming soon. So I know for you, and we just talked about this a second ago, the first part of, of this process is the awareness of the fact that there can be significant factors Uh, for certain cultures and and for just that family influence. And for you, it arose during your own divorce. So I wonder if we we could start with your backstory, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's a great place because I, you know, I I, I thought of it, I thought of it as living in in some sort of a bubble, you know, a bubble of tradition, uh, religion, a beautiful family uh, uh, traditions of, you know, food and celebration and get togethers, dancing. I, I mean, it, it, you're so entwined. It, you, you said it right. And it's, you know, I grew up from a little one, uh, you know, in that culture, you know, so I'm of my, just to give you a little background. I'm of, I'm South Asian, but I'm part of the Indian diaspora. So what is the Indian diaspora? It is Indians that are either displaced and their, their homeland is India. So my folks were in the Caribbean. So 
My dad was in Guyana, was born in Guyana. He was one of 13 kids. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. My mom, a Trinidadian, born one of 12 children. And my mom grew up in uh, the Hinduiz- Hinduism tradition, religion, and my dad, Christianity. And, mm-hmm. and you, Christianity is pretty big in India. So it wasn't, you know, we, we grew up under both uh both uh beautiful you know traditions and religions and i found f- we grew up and i can't speak for the whole culture or you know it's i'm speaking from my experience but i found that family came first and you made decisions from the the, the role of the family identity and not so much your individual identity and I was in that bubble, so I didn't really know uh, that, you know, that I, I had the potential to make my own decision making. From young, we were taught to seek our parents, other elders, being um, grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, advice about who to marry, when to marry, what to study, where to live. So from young, you're in this, these beautiful uh you know beautiful um i want to say traditions of of having the family be close knit and ha- having the support uh because there's a lot of support that comes a lot of support uh in terms of you know uh family helping you if they know of a job opportunity within the culture if that you know there's just so many beautiful things that come, uh, Susan. Uh, But the issue I found is, you know, in my divorce, when I was looking for support there, uh, it was because it was a family affair. And uh, there was entanglements and investments on both sides, my ex-husband's and my side. uh, there was a lot of resistance and um, in my, in my side, mostly a lot of vitriolic and a lot of fear-based thinking. And right. that really, it woke me up. It really, it really was a hard um, road to follow, but a very, a very um, enriching one. Well, and, and you do a beautiful job in the book describing that journey. And, and I really thought it was lovely that you point out and you just said this, but you know, that family involvement in your life, that family identity as a overriding structure for your life has its pros and cons, right? It has the pro of an enormous amount of support Mm -hmm. from not just your, your nuclear, nuclear family, but this extended family, but Mm -hmm. with it came an extraordinary amount of pressure to both achieve and to live life a certain way, I guess I'll say. Right, right. I mean, I found, you know, I found my parents, and I say this in the book, they place your their highest hopes on, on you and their, their fears as well, you know. My biggest, the biggest dream my mom had for me was to marry well and uh, to be taken care of and secure and uh, to have a family and, you know, to continue passing traditions down that I had learned. And why did she have that hope? Well, that was the hope given to her by her parents. And that's what she saw. (laughs) So yes, absolutely. Well, and it's what she was, you know, culturally and socially uh, sort of told was a successful life plan for a woman, right? There were definite, I know another thing that you dealt with was that there was a role for women and a role for men in relationships. Yes, absolutely. And I love the word that you're bringing the the role that was, and I talk about this in my book, Susan, I, the, the, my path on my divorce, it helped me see that I was in different roles, role of wife, daughter-in-law, you know, daughter, and, you know, these roles uh, were putting enormous pressure on me in different ways. And I really had to see at the end of the day, uh, what am I living? Who am I living for? Am I living for myself? And 
could I live for myself? Well, you know, is could I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, you know, it starts with these small baby steps of asking yourself these uh, self inquiring questions of, you know, why am I so in, um, why am I so in turmoil or why am I walking on eggshells in these relationships? Right. Well, and, and you talk about that in the book as well, right? You, you had, if you wanted to look at the checklist of success, that your parents had, mm-hmm. you had checked off all the boxes. You had the husband, you had the beautiful life, you had the home, um, and yet you were not happy. No, and that was it because you know it's I was chasing the what was what I was taught was successful. I was chasing it, you know, and I was in that time also I was trying to make everybody happy. You know, because the other thing I saw growing up, Susan, was, well, as a woman, you put your side, your needs aside Mm -hmm. and, you know, first come, there's a hierarchy. (laughs) You have to, you know, make sure that um, elders are happy and, you know, um, your husband and your children. And maybe if there's a little bit for you left, then you'll get to it. But uh, it, it was this constant, you know, giving of yourself to others, but not really being taught how to either uh, put yourself first and also even how to uh, fill up that well, or, or it wasn't even acceptable to fill up that well, you know, that was another, there was many little nuances that kept folks, both men and women in their roles, because, because men also were taught, you have to be the breadwinners, you have to excel because you have to go to this kind of school you have to Mm -hmm. have this kind of job and you know you you have this particular partner that does these things and at some point you know um there's they males have their level of stresses as well and that's what i learned in the journey as well yeah it's actually those pressures are different but they're, they're full on pressures on both sides of that fence and both sides of that relationship in that family structure are struggling against those or to live up to those standards that are being set. I mean, the bar that is set on both sides, you mentioned um, one instance of um, somebody, you know, how could you let your cousin get higher scores on your test than you did, right? So there were pressures to excel for women as well uh, for both sides. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You know, men also, they, when they were expected to take care of their parents financially as well, you know, if, especially if the, uh, the mother is widowed, she would live with a child, you know, they don't, it's, it's, it's not really accustomed to to put parents in a retirement home and such. So it's, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, and all that goes into factoring the way you set as a male, I would assume you set up, you set up your career, right? Because <laughs> you've got to right. take care of these uh, aspects. Well, you have to take care of the prior generation and you have to take care of your children. And, you know, I can see sort of the cyclical aspect to this where you're raising your children with the expectation that like you are going to take care of your parents your children will take care of you. And, and there's a lot of, you know, I, I want to say there's a lot of beauty in the construct. There's a lot of, um, you know, this has worked for generations for families, but when you run into a situation like you did, or like some of my listeners may have, you know, I, I, one thing I re- that really struck stood out for me in reading the book was your parents' reaction to your decision to divorce. Um, you know, your mom asked if you were having enough sex and, and was your husband seeing someone else, right? That's, that's where she went first. And your husband, your, your father, excuse me, your father was reading Bible verses to you. Yes, absolutely. Because it goes back to that self image of, you know, we have to protect the image of the family, you know, that's, and that's what I, I couldn't see that at the time. It was very painful what was happening uh, to me at that time. And, and yes, you know, with, with one of the, some of the lessons I was taught by my mom was, you know, 
all men cheat. Um, I've seen it. I've grown up. It's it's uh, something that is un understood, uh, right? And not, I guess you know understood. And um, so it was consciously and unconsciously taught, you know. And uh, so you know that I could see why she went there, you right. know. Uh, and also, unfortunately, when you see these breakdowns of marriages. Um, it's really it's it can be quite trying on the woman because at some point uh, folks are looking at her as, as what did she do wrong or yeah. what is the breakdown you know why you know she may be the main cause of the breakdown um, is she not keeping her partner happy enough you know and things like that so there's there's some or I I was working with a client recently and one you know one of the one of those things that was being uh, said in in her case was <clears throat> she was leaving you know the marriage and the the culture uh, was saying you know oh she's become so educated she's too educated for her partner so you know it's these kinds of backlash of one's uh, credibility um, that really is disheartening well disheartening and you know it strikes me as long as you are, and I'm not going to come up with the right phrase, but as long as you, as a member of a family unit or extended family unit as a merit, you know, you've got two families really who are very entwined in your lives when you're married. Um, as long as you are following the path that's expected and hitting the benchmarks, that full on support is there. But yes. what happens, unfortunately, is if you diverge, then that support not only disappears, but you are there's there's a negativity that is brought in, I think is what I hear you saying that, you know, what are you doing wrong or you are wrong? Yes. And I, I'm going to say, Susan, it can also be a negativity by some of your closest ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've had clients where their father has told them that, oh, well, men cheat, you know, that's just part of the, so it's these, you know, you go and you, and naively, I think I thought I would be supported, but it, it comes back as you need to work harder. You need to do better. You need to fix this. And then, so then I think that adds another level of your, on the, another uh, level of barriers to your divorce process and the way you're thinking for your future self, right? Because right. that that's another issue that comes up is, and I have a step in my book about that. It's really being able to, uh, you know, start to step outside of expectations of the culture to really create the person you're stepping into. Well, let's talk about that because you have seven practices, right? You talk yeah. about seven practices and the book sets them out beautifully. So if someone finds themselves in this situation, and I know there are many, many people out there who are listening, who, whether it is this particular cultural situation or a different cultural expectation, or just, you know, that, that family is not supportive of this new journey that you are taking. You know, where would you tell someone to start to to work with their family and to help both sides move through this process? Right, right. Yeah. So I, you know, for me, I started acknowledging how unhappy I was. That really was the first. It started with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, before I could could you know, and bring in the family or the culture, I really had to take it back to uh, me. So I, I had to, I, I think I was living a life of denial. I was living a life of denial, um, you know, denying that I wasn't, uh, you know, denying that I wasn't happy, uh, denying that, um, that I wasn't fulfilled, uh, denying that I, I had a partner that that wasn't emotionally available, which was my comfort zone, as you learned in in, in the book. Yeah. Um, and I I was growing. I wanted something different. <laughs> so once I um, 
started undenying and started seeing that, hey, wait a minute, I'm in a, a lot of turmoil here. Um, some, I need to do something different. That really is what the first, that was the first step was facing that unhappiness um, instead of pushing it away um, or ignoring it or finding ways to busy myself. Yeah, because well, you're almost rewarded for denial in, in the family construct, right? Deny that you're unhappy, act as if you're happy. As long as you're acting as if you're happy, everything is fine. Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, I find that a lot of the couple models I had around me, their relationships, you know, they were, there was this level of dissatisfaction, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, it was working for them in terms of there was material security. There was, uh, you know, someone taking care of the household. There was, they, they were getting something out of it as I was experiencing myself. Uh, so it's, it's quite comfortable to mirror that if you're in that kind of level of dissatisfaction, if you will. Right. So I, so really it starts with you. I love that, that, idea that you need to because i think we know right we know when we are even when everything is beautiful on and shiny on the outside if we internally are discordant with what works for us and our life that we are living is not actually fulfilling us we know but we will stuff that down and in the cultural situation here again stuffing it down was rewarded. It was expected, not even just rewarded, but expected. So what is, once you take that step to acknowledge to yourself that something has to change, there still has to be a huge fear now because you yeah. are bucking the trend. Yes, absolutely. And I think what was happening with me, Susan, is my suffering uh, was out, it, it was growing so much more than the fear. So okay. when that happens, it was motivating me to get out of that situation. And so I did things where I, uh, I had, a, I had a friend who had just had a divorce and I, and at that time I really didn't have friends that were divorce that I could go talk to. So I, I had, and I, and so I went and I, I spoke to that friend and she gave me the information of a therapist. And that's, so I started being, once I decided I wanted to do something different, mm -hmm. it was like little steps came in front of me where I could, I could take them. And, um, I, you know, I, I, once I got into therapy and it was, it was scary at first because you don't know what to expect. And also there's a cultural taboo to, to seeking out therapy, you know, right. um, which I found for myself, it, it really helped me a lot to, to have someone to talk about the, the feelings and emotions and things that were rolling around in my head and the things that I was experiencing and then having someone uh, validate that, you know, oh, it's okay what you're feeling. No, you're supposed, that's right. You, you, that's, yeah. You're supposed to be upset if that happens. <laughs> right, well, but, but you hadn't heard that your whole life, really. No. That, it, that was the antithesis of what you heard. No, in fact, I know, you know, I said it in my book growing up, we were, we were kind of raised with thick skin, you know, hey, why, you know, why are you being sensitive? You're being moody, um, you know, stop crying, you know, things like that. So we, you know, we were raised to, to shut our emotions down. And as imagine, and I talk about it in my book, my parents had a lot less than I did. So I can only imagine some of the things they endured. So, well, and it is generational and it does, things do carry forward. Um, but, you know, so your parents were extremely resistant to this divorce in the beginning, as I described, and, and that didn't go away quickly. No, it was a process. No. And I have to say it increased. I have to say when I made the decision, uh, it, it, the fear from them increased and their, their, you know, 
fear of they they started saying things how are you going to manage on your own how are you going to support yourself you're making the biggest mistake you have a good life you go on vacations all this stuff came out and it was just like it felt like i was i needed to rethink my decisions and you know that kind of thing and i'm to blame i'm the failure i need to make this go away and uh it was it was quite trying so i would say after i you know after i came out of denial of what was happening to me and then seeked help i i would say the other thing that really helped me was understanding my parents and the culture's thinking because then i could take off that cultural lens and when i started doing that it was so revolutionary um for me susan and i started then what was happening i was starting i started distancing um myself to from folks so i could get more headspace and be and and what was happening is my own feelings of what do i want in for my future what do my own thought processes started coming up to i would say the own my own individuality started coming up versus being part of the family identity so it's really when i spent that time um like doing things like journaling my thoughts and feelings i started journaling i i did a ton of um yoga at home and in you know classes uh to to what was happening was i was breathing stretching and crying a lot uh and other things that i did was i discovered nature so i went into nature i started doing little neighborhood walks then it turned into half day hikes and then it you know so i what was happening i was starting to build a new reality for myself where my individuality could come out does that make sense tell you know what it reminds me of as you're saying it is you know how teenagers start pushing boundaries with their parents and they start to individuate and they're no longer and and that's a struggle in so many families but it sounds almost like you got to do your teenage individuation much later in life because it wasn't a part of your cultural norm for you to actually do that yes because i went from growing. a very traditional household to a yep. very traditional marriage i mean my partner he, he was an international student from india and yep. i would go to india spend time with his folks you know i went one trip on my own and spent a month plus with just his parents so these relationships ran deep i mean so when i came out of that i was really um it it was like a a a, a baby in a new world i think <laughs> or a teenager in a new or world a right yeah in a new world yes. yeah exactly so, but eventually and and you you go in the book through you know how this worked out but eventually you did get to a point where your family did support you in your new process and in your new life and in your new path. Yes, absolutely, absolutely because I they what was happening I I think for me is I started feeling good about myself. I started doing the work to feel confident and be okay with being alone. That was another mm -hmm. thing. I didn't growing up Susan, I didn't see women travel alone, live alone. Um take themselves out alone for vacations or i didn't see any of that so you know i as i was infusing all of this and becoming this new woman i would go to family events i would go and stay with my parents i would so they they got to see the transformation and um i feel what happened was i was showing them something new um and someone new that that is becoming more confident in themselves so for i i believe what happened was that put them at ease but i have to say too i also learned to start exercising boundaries with them as well being in the same space so so give an example of a boundary that you needed to set with your family yeah so for one example is if i was with them and they wanted to have talk about the divorce mm -hmm. tell us about the finances tell us about this 
I wouldn't engage. I would say, hey, no, everything's fine. I'm handling it. My attorney has got it. We ha- I have a good team. I'm doing great. So I started to find, I started to learn, first of all, what would be the trigger, like what would upset me that they would say. And once I could see, oh, when they talk about the divorce, or they talk about my soon to be ex, or they talk about me being alone or living alone, I started seeing, you know, what were my sensitive hot button topics, and then I created the boundaries around that. That's, I mean, goes back to what we've been talking about a little bit is the awareness, right? What's going to push your button? And then one, just being aware that it's going to push your button helps you know that you need to deal with it. And you can also put in place some strategies for how you're going to handle it so that you knew if your parents brought up, you know, what is, what are you getting in the divorce financially? You, you knew what to say. Exactly. And I, and I also did this thing called priming, which I tell my clients about when I would go into, into, uh, you know, family events, there was many, (laughs) uh, especially around the holidays. Yes. Um, I primed myself. So what did I do? If I was going to attend a family event, I would make sure and take care of myself, jump into a yoga class, go into nature, journal my feelings, because the whole point of it is I wanted to show up at that family event, feeling my best. So I had the awareness in case anything came up, I could, I could um, head it off, so to say, um, and not be taken into some sort of um, cycle of destruction or what have you. Got, well, I call it the conflict cycle, right? Somebody <laughs> says something to you, you respond to them and around and around we go. So I like that idea of priming. You know how they call it? that comes from priming the pump to get the water up into the pump. And you know, not only centering and grounding yourself before you went into those situations, but also to, to go back to you and knowing and ex- fully expecting that your mom was going to say something, your aunt was going to say something, one of your cousins mm-hmm. was going to say something, because it wasn't just your mom and dad. It no. was, it's the entire family structure. I mean, these events had sometimes 60 plus, 100 plus people, and you're, everybody knows your business because you know, it's the, everyone's talking about, oh, did you know such and such such is happening? And so absolutely, I love what you said. Absolutely. One of the things I, I, I tell my clients to is expect anything. When you go there, expect anything. So it, it, it kind of takes the edge off of being surprised, you know? Also, another thing that helped me in those environments is to find ways to get breathers, you know, uh, because I will tell you, when you go into environments like that, where, you know, there's gossiping, um, and, and folks, you know, they'll smile and may not have the best, <laughs> uh, may not actually what's going on in here is a little <laughs> different than what's coming out here. Yeah, right. And you can feel it. Um, so for me, uh, you know, I, I would, you know, take bathroom breaks, I would go and go into the bathroom, have a breathing exercise or go outside and look at a tree, go and fix myself a cup of tea. But what am I doing? I'm infusing breaks in 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 um, in the atmosphere. Yeah, let your nervous system actually settle because that's a constant state of anxiety when you're in the midst of a room full of people who are judging you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because, you know, I had a, I had a string of things. I had folks say, you know, are you all right? Is everything okay? Um, you know, other folks say, and this is, these are family members. Yes. Um, oh, you know, is it upsetting you that, you know, do you get upset or, or, or do you feel, you know, something is wrong if I'm with my wife, you know, oh, or, right. You know, so there was a lot of things. It was almost like you go into an environment where, um, you know, people, it's almost like you have to make them feel okay. <laughs> yeah. You're going through the transition. Yes. Yes. Well, it's funny you say that. It makes me think many years ago, uh, my father had a, a problem with alcohol. So many years ago, I made the decision not to drink alcohol. And it makes people very uncomfortable at times. And, and I get that, not that, is it okay for me to be here with my husband? It's, is it okay for me to have a glass of wine? I'm like, of course it's okay for a glass of wine, but you're right. Yes. Um, sometimes, well, and I think that 
you know, we live in a society where alcohol is a norm. You're talking about a culture where being in a relationship, happy or not, is the norm. Uh, mm -hmm. So people were uncomfortable with your, your bucking the norm. So to speak. Yes. And I got to say, I was, a, I was very, you know, I, I was very different in that Susan, I, I didn't have kids. So when I would go to, you know, uh, family functions, a lot would be said, you know, um, oh, you know, you don't have kids. How are you fulfilled? Did, I mean, a lot of, a lot of things. So, um, you know, that priming really helped me and really, really helped me. And I will say I do a post priming. So after I leave that, uh, you know, either the, the evening of or the next day, it's me time where I prime. Yeah, well, and, and I was just thinking, you know, that topic in the cultural norms of not having children, we probably could do an entire episode on that, because I can imagine that had to be um, a situation where you were bucking the norm as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I, I do want to point out to listeners, you know, you have seven very clearly delineated steps to working with your family and working with yourself um, and to ultimately get to that place where uh, I really, you know, it was beautiful to, that you're able to get to a place where that family support, even though you are no longer walking the path, perhaps that was envisioned for you is there again and a, a happiness in your happiness. So it is possible. And we know that from your story um, and that's what you're helping people do. So I want to encourage people to reach out for, uh, for your wonderful offer. You're, you're giving away free e-copies of the book. Can you um, let people know how they would reach out to you to get that? Sure, sure. So they can reach out to me directly via email. So, so perhaps you could put this you know, in, in the, the notes as well, but they can contact me, first name Cindy, C-I-N-D-Y, and my company's name, Stillness Blooms, at stillnessblooms.com. Perfect. Um, and I don't want to forget, because you have a wonderful retreat coming up in one of my favorite places, Costa Rica, um, in August of 2022. Tell us about the, the retreat and how people can find out more. So I got to tell you, so the whole, the one of the biggest lessons I learned in my divorce, Susan, was how to start listening to my inner voice, my intuition, that higher self, put whatever label you want on it. But the point is you, we have this, this North compass that whispers, that talks loud when we're in danger, that, that hits our gut. You know, if we're around someone and our hair, the hair is raised on our arm, all yep. that you should be listening to. So um, that was what I came out from my divorce was trust your intuition always. So uh, this, this retreat is all about list how to how to recognize how to listen, not run away from it, because it can be scary sometimes how to listen to the messages of your retreat of your um, intuition, and how to do it. If so, it comes consistently, it's a consistent practice to have to tap into that inner voice. Uh, so you can get your steps in really hard situations. So it's a women's retreat, uh, very intimate, um, max 11 folks, and it's set in a 600 acre rainforest, natural preserve jungle, two thermal rivers running through it. Um, and it's really going to help uh, women get in touch with that inner voice, which I will tell you, when you get in touch with that inner voice, that inner voice, saves you time, it saves you money, it saves you energy, and it helps you find very fulfilling relationships, both personally and professionally. Oh, there's so, I mean, think about the journey that you told us about in this episode and that you talk about in the book, right? It started with you hearing that inner voice and, and knowing, because because outwardly you had everything you were supposed to have to be happy. And yet you weren't, and you were, you were not listening to that voice. And it wasn't until you did that started you on this journey. And anyone, if you're not watching the video, you can't see, but if you could see Cindy's face and her smile and just have, have having spoken to her, you know, you, you know, when somebody is in alignment with their intuition and their inner values, and um, you can just see it in your face, you glow. 
Well, thank you, Susan. And I got to say, I am living my best life. I have a loving partner. I have a beautiful dog. We have plans for marriage and kids. It's coming. So (laughs) I got to say, there's a lot. When you step into your inner voice, there's there's a whole lot waiting for you. I'm I'm living proof. So there's there's a great note to to end on living being living proof, especially for. Um, I, oh, I wanted to mention your other book because I love the, the title. Your most recent book is "Listen to Yourself: The Brown Girl's Guide to Trusting Your Intuition," which is the number one Amazon international bestseller. So, to my brown girls out there who need a special, a, l- a little extra help listening to that in, uh, intuition, uh, y- you are a, a wonderful, glowing example. But really, for anyone on this path or this inner journey of honoring their true self, of honoring their intuition, of being able to step outside the expectations of family, of culture, of the world at large, right? Society has a lot of expectations of us and um, we we deserve to live our life and be happy. And I found, Susan, too, when I stepped out, I've become a role model for young brown girls for women that are in my culture that they couldn't do it. They get to see something different too. So it, there's a lot at stake when, when you are brave enough to, to, to step out and just listen. Yes. Well, and it takes the bravery and thank you for your bravery and for, for talking about this topic. Cause I know that it, you're going to help oh so many of my listeners um, as they find themselves where, where you were um, a few, few years back. So thank you so much, Cindy. I will have all of your contact information and the information about how to get the book and about the retreat. Don't miss out on the retreat folks, um, in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Susan. Really? Thank you.